just a mess. <laughs> we're resetting the green room at the back. That's like a climate controlled, humidity controlled room. So we've got a little bit of buffer stock that's gonna take us through for like weekend orders and bits and bobs. We don't really tend to hold much roasted coffee. Um, do you sell test batches? No, we, we share them with people. Uh, we get users for feedback, use them internally for testing uh, and run them down. We do do full size test batches, but no, not really for sale because it's too much of a punt and often the way we're running the QC program, we will have already had to have left the building to make for timely deliveries before we can get around to resting it out and tasting it properly. I would say that we are reliant on some technologies and some pieces of equipment here. We're not nerdy about it, we don't do it for the sake of it. We use certain meters and uh, pieces of kit to just help us be more consistent. Mm -hmm. One of the main things for me, especially my role here, is, is to ensure that people get a consistent product. So whilst the lots might change, whilst maybe our roast approach might change, consistently high quality, unwavering uh, in hitting that aim is, is really my goal. So that's only really possible with like the team knowing what they're doing, m movement of the, the crops, the lots through the system that we've uh, done, as well as passing lots of checkpoints. So the moisture of the sacks is the first checkpoint when we're weighing out. And then we've got like the calibrated scales that we use for the green and roasted batches to, to, get, really, um, to get the right weight weighed out ahead of time. In here, relative humidity is kept at 55 to 60. Temperatures are around 18 degrees year round. So sometimes that's chilling the room, sometimes it might actually be warming it up. Having this room is like a, a really good cheat <laughs> for us to be more consistent. Has the process of what you've achieved changed a lot? And if so, how have you maintained that consistency? It's really funny you say that because we, we recently had our 10 year anniversary and we were trying to like put together like a really grand thought of like how we've changed over the years. And I, I said to, to some of the guys, I was like, we really haven't. We've had a, a bold goal from the off of like being solely dedicated on like getting you great coffee, whether you're a customer coming to a cafe or buying a bag of beans online. And we haven't really strayed from that. It hasn't been chasing new fads or trends or, you know, expanding the range of uh, coffees into like RTDs and whatnot. It's, it's been still sourcing great coffee and roasting it as well as we can using every uh, tool at our disposal to do so, being brutally honest when we do quality control, um, making sure the team is dedicated and, and trained up to give you good coffee. So uh, in a way we haven't really changed that much. We might have you know, taken on a few extra processes and maybe changed our approach to how to actually do that and our, and our idea of like the best way to showcase a particular lot might have changed and some of the coffees we're buying might have changed. But ultimately it's, you know, we want sweetness, we want a fresh character, we want uh, clean characteristics. That hasn't really shifted over the years. So Chris is currently testing the, and I'm sure, basically, uh, do you see the little figures at the bottom of the board uh, next to N1, N2? That's telling you the oxygen content within the bags. So we, we want to have below 2% as a minimum, but under one is wicked. You know, 20% oxygen in the atmosphere, that's going to degrade coffee at a certain rate. Um, so, so degassing will sort of reduce that anyway naturally, but we, we put nitrogen in to displace the oxygen, so it's starting with a really low number. So the actual interference of oxygen in that staining process is really stalled. We just have this nozzle here, so you can... It comes out here, and we fill the, the bag from here. Slide it onto the nozzle to flush all... Well, it's a displacement technique. So it's not about the nitrogen being good, it's about atmosphere being bad. So you flush out the atmosphere, then you seal it. Take a reading with the fantastically named Oxy Baby, and that'll tell you how much oxygen there is in there. You don't need to use that, but we want to check and make sure that we're calibrated on the flow, how we're actually doing it with technique. And they were getting great numbers from the office. I'm like, well, okay, everything's dialed in nicely for the packaging. Every bag of beans will put a postcard with it, so you've got a little bit of information about the coffee, because I think without that, uh, you know, relying on flavor alone is fine, but I feel, I feel like you get more enjoyment when you know a few fun things about something. Like if you get served a glass of wine and they just, even if they say one sentence about the provenance behind it, you're like, oh, I can, I get, I'm getting an, an enriched enjoyment now. I'm getting more out of this glass of wine. Or same, same with coffee. If you told a couple of things about it that take you to a place or, or just, just inform you a little bit or give you a, that reminder to look out for something, mm. just that pay attention uh, cue, really. I'm trying to do more than just say like, oh, you will, you will taste like a, cherry and plum or whatever whatever it might be it's like well how how is that structure like what kind of are you getting aroma of that or is it reminding you of the acidity or like the way your mouth feels after eating that like, i feel like the way the flavors interact if you write it in a sort of prosy way with referencing structure and sort of how the how the length of the coffee plays out that's going to be more it was going to be more evocative maybe yep. and, and and you know paint, paint a picture of how the flavors changes the coffee cores and all that kind of stuff so yeah, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about flavour notes recently as well, and I almost think we need to maybe have it multi-tiered. So have like those grabby headline like captions, but I, I, I like how we do it. I love it. <laughs> 2012, 
I joined workshop, uh, no, I'm so sorry, 2013 I joined workshop. Uh, my role's changed to chief product officer, so it's like all, all, all the areas concerning the, the product, the coffee, basically. The hardest part is being honest uh, with yourself when you've done something wrong, I, I would say. Like, if your coffee doesn't taste good, it's really hard to admit that. If you, you know, spend a lot of money on it, taking time to, to get all the release materials together and ro having roasted it back to all this stuff. If you're then like, I don't think this is good, that's very tough to, to admit to yourself. Right. And then, um, you know, coming up with a solid, informed plan as to how to improve things. Um, that's hard. Yeah. And, and, you know, just monotony, I would say, is hard. You know, for most of the people in the building, it's the same thing every day, right? It's a lot of cleaning, it's a lot of weighing, mm -hmm. it's a lot of packing. Um, making that interesting and fun is hard. So, we have, you know, we have staff lunch every day. So Sam cooked today, a little chili, Christine's uh, made some meals this week. So we've got, we've got a lot of staff kitchen here. And we try and all sit together and, like, that, you know, have a break to the, for the day and make it nice. And then the payoff is, you know, like cupping. When you do taste everything, and you're like, oh, it's worth it. Because, you know, like this morning, for example, we did a big cupping, and it was like, this is, this is a real joy. Like, it was an exciting Super, one. super nice um, results. There's an element of putting personal preference aside to a small degree, you know. I, I always will love the coffees we're going to buy, but also I won't buy some things that I do enjoy, because I know uh, they might not perform over time in the way we'll need them to. You know, like something that is really expressive and, and intense and, and lovely the first time we cover our origin yeah. that might not translate to something that's you know gonna behave well in the shipping and uh, until we get to roast it and release it you just know it's gonna sort of nosedive and lose all that character wow. um, so yeah sometimes you can be really impressed with something give it a high score and then actually be like but it's not for me it's not for our business we do nothing really too crazy here it's 10 grams of coffee it's 165 grams of water that I'm confident is that because of the cups being pretty truncated so you'll, you'll take it, put it in there, drink from this one, that's just the bowl, it's like, yeah, then, and then. Mm -hmm. I already did it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, this one for your lips, this one for the cup. So pour across. So for that, and then I can still clean. Mm -hmm. Incredible creaminess I'm getting from this one. Okay, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Into the bowl. Amazing. And I always build this one, it's like, this is morning coffee. Just like, have a mug of that, it's a hug, it's so chocolate, caramel. You know, the good kind of nuts. No! <laughs> it's muscle memory. Yeah. This is so, the one for me that's like orange, fleshy fruits. Do you always describe it as acidity or sometimes tanginess? Or are they the same to you? I would say tanginess is like a kind of acidity. Right. Like tart, crisp, ripe. They're, they're all sort of modifiers of acidity for me. Um, How many different ways can, is there to describe acidity? Oh, that's interesting. So I would say you, you can break it into two ways. There's, the route you've gone there is if you are learning to identify particular acids in coffees and you, you can re recognize malic acidity or citric acidity or tartaric acidity or phosphoric acidity, something like that, mm. how, how a particular chemical compound presents in terms of flavor, that's one thing. And that's kind of like, a, you know, uh, if you're assessing cork taint in wine, it's like recognizing a particular chemical compound or something like that. But the other thing would be more of like, um, maybe marketing speak, but also how, how does it, present to you, so that might be like it's really nippy, or it's really tart, or it's really piquant, or it's really juicy, or it's really ripe. That's maybe more like experiential, rather than actually drilling into what is it at play creating that, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, you could describe it any way you want, really. And then also, I would say you've got the negative sounding words, like when someone says it's sour, Yeah. you might find it deliciously bright and refreshing and tart, but for them it's sour because they don't want that acidity in their coffee, so they're like, oh, something's wrong, sour, and that's fine. It might be that two people experience it differently because some people don't want that. And then you have things like acetic acid, where it might be a taint or a, a, a fault in the coffee that's gone vinegary. Right. Lactic acidity, very trendy. Butric uh, acid. Butric acid, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, just absence of any defects. To me, it's just a great example of what specialty coffee can do to coffee. Yeah, just yeah. This is it. But actually, what you said first intrigued me more, where you're like, the absence of a defect because it's a pretty cold way of describing specialty coffee. It's kind of how you do it with physical analysis, at least, like the absence of defective beans or maybe the absence of defective flavors in the cup. But actually getting a coffee to someone without marring it along the journey is quite tricky. And I, I really like um, Cloudwater Brewery and in their uh, philosophy, they talk about like presenting the brews with the least possible instance of off flavors. I'm like, what a strange thing to say about your own product like, as a way to like tell someone what you're trying to do. Yeah. But then that's like brutal honesty. It's like, because we very easily can and you won't notice and people aren't trained to spot this difference but you know 
drink any bottle in a uh, beer in a clear bottle and you've got probably a defective beer That's true. and and uh yeah you're right like it is a great example of something which is like squeaky clean really transparent you can taste all the fruit there's no over roasting there's no under roasting there's no like old crop flavor though there's no nuttiness from quakers or anything it's like very it's ripe easy. fruit it's just it's so agreeable it's yeah. so easy and, and wonderful well it's funny as well because i remember wendell Bow saying in a live video at some point that sometimes when people come into the coffee shop the words they use to describe what they think they want are often quite wrong. So they might say like, I don't want a coffee with any acidity, but then they'll serve them a Kenyan coffee with lots of acidity and be like, this is perfect. And maybe they mean bitterness, but actually it's like, there's a lot of acidity here, but it doesn't present a sour to me. And I think a lot of people could, could drink that who are like, I don't want acidity in my coffee, but actually be like, it's so sweet and such a clear, lovely fruit flavor that actually it's quite gentle. These are upcoming sneak previews, demo CDs, as we said earlier. When they pick, they have a reception tank up near the trees and then this like, uh, shoot system that they've built to, to send the coffee cherry down to the reception tank to do floating. So rather than have to carry it down, they're like, let's put it in the slide. And the fruit just tumbles down. And this is like velvet. The mouthfeel is just like, oh, really so, so velvety. And a, and a new kind of sweetness. Okay. See, my, my brain and my taste buds are so connected without me actually understanding. So they talk to each other and when I taste <laughs> something new, a little bell goes off saying, yeah, yeah. I haven't tasted that before. Yeah, yeah. I'm not always sure how to identify what's going on. But that, that's just the, the, how your brain is made. Your verbal centers are not very close to your memory receptors and olfactory receptors. So that's why it's so hard to voice an experience you're getting in taste and smell. Right. It's literally how your brain is wired. And the way you do it is, is through, through memory and, and regurgitating memories and building those bridges and strengthening them up. Right.